I'm John Askinis. I'm a senior non-resident fellow at the Lincoln Network and an academic at Catholic University. And I'm really pleased to be joined by uh, Jimmy Sony, uh, author of The Founders, which is sort of the first real serious history of PayPal. But it's also so much more than that. It's really about the evolution of Silicon Valley and America's uh, technology system. Uh, and Corey Doctorow, uh, who's Accomplishments are are too many to name, but is a is both a serious uh, civil libertarian and privacy thinker and an acclaimed uh, science fiction author, uh, who wrote the best book on Web three, uh, Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom, which I highly recommend to you. He wrote it 20 years ago. Um, so on that note, let's get started. Uh, the theme of the panel is uh, thinking about uh, the uh, well. Hold on, I should add this ad. Was that well? It started as theme of the '90s, but actually, it was, it was an evolving theme. It's an evolving theme. Uh, seize and evolving the means panel. of computation. That's right. Seize the means of computation. Big tech, radical interoperability, and digital utopianism. So, Jimmy, when, when PayPal was founded in the 1990s, uh, the dream of the '90s was very much alive. Uh, the internet was going to bring uh, radical freedom. It was going to, you know, break the power of the state. And this is something that the many of the PayPal founders that you chronicle really believe seriously. You know, today, uh, P PayPal is. Uh, very much an uh, establishment operation. You know, there was concerns about changing terms of service to seize money from users if they did a misinformation. Uh, what changed at PayPal, and it did it have to change? Start out with the easy question. Um, no, just thank you, John, for moderating, Lincoln for, for hosting us, and, and everybody who's here in attendance. Um, I had this really interesting experience the last, like, six years of essentially like barricading myself in the years 1998 to 2002 to understand the rise and the creation of PayPal. And, and I think I took this sometimes to extremes. Like I had this policy with my friends that they weren't allowed to send me news about the PayPal protagonists that came out like after 2006 or seven. And I kind of blocked all most contemporary news sources and I would start my day by reading these like old blog links from like 97, 98, 99, 2000. Like, I, like the way I thought about this in my head is like there are method actors and then there are method writers. And I was like, oh, like to fully inhabit the world of like, you know, the 1999 internet, I'm not gonna like switch to a dial-up internet just, just for my sanity, but I am gonna try to, you know, understand how that, what that era felt like to the best of my ability. Um, you know, I, I, I I think that the, the question's interesting. I'm probably better positioned to comment on the origin story than on what's going on with contemporary PayPal, just because it's not an area of coverage or focus for me. Um, what I would say is that at, the, at PayPal's very outset, like at the early, early days, so this is late 1998 when Max Levchin and Peter Thiel are you know, thinking about Palm Pilot digital currencies, and early 1999, when a young Elon Musk is thinking about X.com and like a super bank or like a kind of financial superstore for everything, there were ideas around like, oh, if we could if we could unshackle people's money from governments, you know, what what would that what could that create? Like very quickly, very quickly, that vision was trimmed to like helping eBay power sellers negotiate payments on eBay as a way of making the company successful. So, you know, one version of the history of PayPal is a history of like compromise right away because you need the company to stay alive because that's what needs to be done. And so I think like even, even though, like I think all companies go through this evolution. There's like a high-minded idealism that's in the pitch deck and in some of the talking points at the water cooler. And then there's the, the reality of, of having to make payroll and of the dot-com bubble bursting. And I think if you were to look at any companies, that's, that's kind of the story. And I don't, by the way, I don't take that as a, as a, I take that as a feature, not a bug. Because the truth is PayPal had to do that to cater to an audience so that its payment system could take off. And the network expanded from eBay to other markets. And we still live and work with PayPal today, though with you know, varying levels of frustration over the last week. Um, and I, and I, I, I think of that as actually like a very natural evolution, and you could track that same storyline through, through com you know, company after company. So, uh, Jimmy, you've given us the kind of the insider view on this sort of evolution from the 1990s. Um, but, uh, Corey, in your work, including your new book, Choke Point Capitalism, you, you tell a little more structural story. So, 
when PayPal was, was founded, um, you know, there were attempts to kill it or co-opt it, most famously by eBay. None of them succeeded, but in part because none of the incumbents were in this space and which were really that large. So uh, w today, the, you, know, you have the five fang companies. There's a hugely consolidated internet. What changed? Yeah, so I, I think that the transmutation of the internet from a million points of light to five giant websites filled with screenshots of text from the other four didn't happen by accident and has to be understood as a kind of uh, accelerating feedback loop between two different phenomena. So one is the drawdown of, of antitrust enforcement that allowed firms to do things that have been historically prohibited, predatory pricing that excluded new market entrants, uh, predatory acquisitions of, of nascent competitors before they could grow to be a threat, and then mergers between major competitors so that, so that they could exclude new rivals. As those firms merged to monopoly, they were able to secure policy wins. Because when you have 100 SMEs in a sector, they can't even agree on how to cater their annual meeting. But when there's like four of them, they can all fit around a table. And when they can all fit around a table, they will. And when they do, they're going to start asking for policy that makes it illegal to be their competitors. And so you see the uh, radical expansion of rules like Section 1201 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. This is very obscure acronym soup stuff. But it's a law that says that if there's DRM in your product, it's a felony to give someone a tool to remove the DRM even if no one commits a copyright infringement in the course of that. So if you're General Motors, you can wrap an engine part in DRM such that the engine won't recognize it until someone types an unlock code into it. Deriving that unlock code from first principles is not hard. It's just a felony punishable by a five-year prison sentence, which means that General Motors gets to monopolize the repair of its cars. This is something that we saw ripple through the web and move its way up into the hard goods sector as we saw embedded systems get cheaper and work their way into all systems so that you could add DRM to printer cartridges, car parts, tractor parts. Uh, Medtronics uses it in their workhorse ventilators, which is why no one could fix ventilators during the lockdown. Uh, and it just, just metastasized across the board. There are a half dozen policies like this. The expansion of software patents, the expansion of doctrines like tortious interference that uh, make it a, a crime to violate terms of service or to allow someone else to violate terms of service. The expansion of cybersecurity law, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is a law that was passed by Ronald Reagan in a panic in 1986 after seeing the movie War Games, which was then expanded into felonizing violating terms of service. This is what Aaron Swartz, who some of you may know is the co-founder of Reddit and the co-creator of RSS, was charged with 13 felonies over facing 35 years in prison when he hanged himself at the age of 23 about a decade ago. So the expansion of these doctrines made it impossible to become a new market entrant. It, it converted a lot of our capital uh, markets into effectively headhunters. So a lot of the firms that are nominally uh, entering the market to compete with the large firms are actually just uh, being teed up for aqua hires. And it turns the venture capital industry into something like a recruiting industry, where we maintain the pretense that you started a company and made a product. What you've actually done is a post-grad project that's been funded by a recruiter so that he could take it as a portfolio piece to a company that will, quote, buy your company throw away the product, put you in a product team, uh, pay your venture capitalist some equity as a finder's fee, pay you some equity uh, as a uh, hiring bonus. But it's not really starting a company. It's just an incredibly inefficient way to do corporate recruiting. So all of that emerges out of the fact that these firms have become very large and that they had excess rents that they could use to uh, acquire policy out outcomes. And they had a really easy collective action problem to solve because there's four or five or three or two of them in each of these sectors. And so when you say, what should the rule be, everybody who understands the process shows up and says, the rule should be this. It should be this thing that is tilted to our parochial favor. And even when we bring them to account and we say, Mark Zuckerberg is an imperfect, unelected, unaccountable social media czar for three billion people, Mark Zuckerberg's answer is, why don't you regulate me? Because his first preference as a monopolist is to not be regulated at all, but his second preference is to be regulated in a way that no one else can afford to be regulated so that he doesn't have to worry about new market entrance, something doing to him what, my, what he did to MySpace. And so that's how we got here, right? It, it's not a mystery. It wasn't the great forces of history bearing down on us. We took a policy choice. That policy choice is not unique to technology. Two firms control all the beer, two firms control all the spirits, four firms control, or three firms control all the shipping, one 
firm controls all the professional wrestling. One firm does all the cheerleading leagues, and because it's the only game in town, parents didn't pull their kids out, and now it's rocked by the most ghastly, hair-curling sexual abuse scandal you can imagine. Right? This ripples out across all the sectors. There is nothing exceptional about technology in that regard. The one exceptional thing about technology are the remedies available to us, which is to say that because technology has this intrinsic character of interoperability, because the only computer we know how to build is the computer that can run all the software we know how to write, we can always build interoperable products that smash holes in walled gardens, that allow you to leave Facebook but stay in touch with your friends at Facebook, just the way Facebook did. When Facebook started and they opened their gates to non.edu customers, they gave them a bot that would log into MySpace on their behalf, take their waiting MySpace messages, put them in their Facebook inbox, and then allow you to reply to them and put them back in your MySpace outbox. If you try to do that to Facebook today, they destroy you. That's what they did to Power Ventures when they tried it. But not because it's technically harder, just because Facebook has acquired the policies needed to use the law to exclude new market entrants. And that's how we got four giant websites filled with screenshots of text from the rest. So the, uh, to play devil's advocate here for a minute, the the uh, pro-monopolist position uh, put forward most eloquently by Peter Thiel is that you need the monopoly rents generated by nat natural or unnatural uh, uh, monopolies to fuel blue sky innovation. Uh, so you know, Google's make, making massive investments in all kinds of crazy moonshots. Um, you know, Zuckerberg is basically tanking his stock value by pouring unbelievable amounts of revenue not into things the shareholders would like, like dividends or better ads, but into the metaverse and VR, and even if it fails, or especially if it fails, is gonna pull the technology forward a decade. Um, Jimmy, you wrote an earlier book on Claude Shannon and Bell Labs, and this is the kind of, Bell Labs is sort of the, um, I think the, the typical example of this kind of phenomenon. Huge, huge monopoly rents, huge investment in, in, in earth-shattering technologies that then form the basis of the internet. At the same time, a lot of those technologies weren't commercialized. Bell Labs invented the, uh, the, um, the voicemail system in like the 30s or 40s and, and sat on it. Uh, it wouldn't let people connect modems to the phone lines and then therefore held back the development of the internet. It's not a coincidence that the very first hackers were phone freakers who were taking advantage of this you know, technical interoperability of using a Captain Crunch whistle to get free calls because call prices were artificially uh, high due to this monopoly. So how do you think about this trade-off between monopoly profits driving innovation, but also the way it can hold back an innovation ecosystem? Yeah, it's a, it's a big, you know, it, it's one of these things that I, I looked at at Bell Labs, just take a step back. I became interested in Claude Shannon because of a really great book called The Idea Factory, which was like a history of Bell Labs. I recommend it. It's by my friend John Gertner. And it kind of asked the question that I tried to ask with the PayPal book, which is how is it that this one company could, could host you know, six, seven Nobel laureates, invent the transistor, invent touchtone dialing, invent satellite technology, communications networks, improve the bazooka and everything else. And one big part of that answer is what you described, which is they had essentially a federally guaranteed monopoly on the phone system. And during the, during the late 30s and 40s, very, very big defense contracts so they could recruit top talent, pay them anything, and kind of warehouse them and let them you know, think. One of the talented people they did that with was Claude Shannon. And you know, like, look, I've thought, a, I've thought a lot about sort of Shannon and productivity and vis-a-vis -vis Bell Labs' monopoly profits. And there's sort of one argument that says, you, Shannon could have been, was basically functionally useless anywhere except for Bell Labs. Like he really would not have been that productive, but in a weird way, like Bell Labs forced him to be productive because they weren't a university and he didn't have tenure, but they weren't sort of like this sort of hard charging private sector enterprise where he was responsible for PNL. So they gave him time to juggle and play chess and also invent information theory, which changed the world. Um, that, that's kind of one argument, but, but I would argue like, more precisely that there's a reason Bell Labs is not around today. Like the, the spark went out of the place and in, in spite of them having a federally guaranteed monopoly. And I think what happened is what happens to a lot of incumbents. You get fat and happy and you don't have to hustle as much to kind of create new products to win new customers. And you end up kind of, kind of petering out. You know, it's sort of like the blockbuster effect, right? Netflix comes along and eats your lunch. Um, I would argue that Amazon has done something similar to publishing, right? Publishing had these sort of, it has its own sort of guaranteed monopoly in some ways, and Amazon comes around and tries some new products and eats their lunch. But my, my thing about Bell Labs is I think that 
Companies where the early creators participate in a significant way in the upside have more incentive to be more innovative. And the model I would use here is, is you know, one of the more recent models is SpaceX, right? I think it's a good thing that SpaceX was not like an offshoot of some other company or like the R&D or nonprofit wing of like, you know, Google, right? Like I, I think that there is really powerful incentive when people want to unite innovation with wealth creation and I think that is fundamentally, especially in the early days, a good thing. I do worry about some of the monopoly tendencies, but I would actually, based on Corey's critique, my, my critique would be with Congress. I'm more worried about congressional incumbency in the House of Representatives than I am like big tech incumbents because I just, there, there's a way in which very ambitious young 20-somethings who have an idea that can't be incubated in one of those big firms are gonna go on, wanna go out and use it to become billionaires. And that is, that is a-okay by me. Um, because I think that, that kind of inspiration, like it's just, you, you wouldn't take something like that and go to Google. Like you would take it and try to raise funds and build your own company. Um, but in the, just to get back to your question about Shannon, you know, Bell Labs was kind of perfect for Shannon for the reason I described that like, emotionally, constitutionally, professionally, it was a great place for him. It had enough money where he didn't need to worry about the money, but it also was like involved in the war effort, so he had to be at least somewhat productive, and it led him to his ideas. I don't know where Shannon would wind up today, but I, I, I'm not as concerned necessarily about like, oh, like we're, you know, sort of miss, I'm, I'm concerned about the misallocation of talent, but it's not connected to like monopolies across these big tech companies. I, so I don't know if I, if I recognize that account. So, you know, if it were the case that allowing firms to just do moonshots would get us moonshots, then you would expect some moonshots from Google. Google is a company that's made two and a half successful products. They made a great search engine, pretty good browser, pretty good Hotmail clone, right? Everything else they've made in-house, including the moonshots, has been an absolute catastrophe. None of them have turned into products. The exception would be Google Photos, which is a product that they bundled with something they bought from someone else. Everything they've got that's a success, they bought from someone else in a way that would have been historically prohibited. Their ad tech stack, their video stack, they couldn't build a video service. Google videos crashed and burned. YouTube, which they bought from someone else, was a success. Server management, um, and of course their mobile platform, all bought from other firms because they couldn't manage it themselves. So we don't see uh, access to the capital markets and uh, um, these monopolies that are a mix of uh, regulatory and market power producing moonshots, we see them producing follies. Sidewalk labs, Wi-Fi balloons. I mean, look, I'm a science fiction writer, right? So that means that I can tell the difference between truth and fiction. And so in the real world, when it's railroading time, you get railroads, right? The thing that makes a helicopter is not da Vinci looking at a, win at a a wine screw press and a maple key and going, aha, helicopter. That happens like every 15 years for 400 years. What gets you the helicopter is metallurgy, oil refining, uh, um, new materials, and looking at a wine screw and a maple key. And that's why, at the same time, four people invented helicopters. Because in the real world, great inventions arise both out of circumstance and out of creativity. It's only in Ayn Rand novels that there's one person who has all the good ideas and we just have to unleash their individual power and without them we will all live in the dark, right? And if you can't tell the difference between a novel and reality, then you end up believing the hype of the people who claim to be geniuses because they were in the right place at the right time and demand that no one else get to be in the right place at the right time for the rest of time. So Corey, uh, you've done a lot of work on, on privacy. And of, of the FANG companies, the company that has uh, done the most for privacy, that has, that has tried to position itself around privacy the most, of course, has been Apple. You know, Tim Cook has even said that uh, he views privacy as a human right. Um, however, there's an asterisk, which is, you know, uh, not available in all countries. How, how can Apple position itself as a defender of privacy when it sells out its users in China? Yeah, I, I agree. I think that you're um, pointing out the, the, the problem with just delegating all trust about how companies treat us to firms. Because it works well to the extent that their interests are co-terminal with ours. They are well situated to defend those interests. They have more money than you or me, right? They have more security researchers on staff, more programmers, more engineers, more product managers. They can make products better than you and I can probably, right? Because of that access to resources. But if they decide that their interests aren't co-terminal with yours, then the wall garden they've built around you to protect you becomes a prison that they use to keep you in. So the same tool that Apple uses 
to make sure nothing bad shows up in the App Store, which is technological and legal countermeasures against sideloading and iOS, is the tool that stopped Chinese users from going outside the App Store to get working VPN tools so that they can uh, evade the Great Firewall of China. Apple has removed all of those. And you don't have to be in China to suffer this. So about two weeks ago, uh, a couple of startup kids developed a, a, a tool called OG App. OG App was a front end for Instagram. Uh, it popped up a web, uh, a web browser window using WebKit. You entered your Instagram login and password. It grabbed the uh, session key. And then it just communicated with the uh, API on your behalf. Didn't send any data to Instagram. And it gave you your Instagram feed minus the ads in chronological order with just your friends and threw away all the dumb TikTok stuff that no one likes. Right? Within 12 hours, Apple had kicked it out. And one of the consequences of kicking that app out of the App Store was that everyone who wants to use Instagram has to use the Instagram client, which doesn't just throw a bunch of ads your way and doesn't just show you stuff out of reverse chrono. It doesn't just do all that dumb TikTok stuff no one wants. It also tracks every press. It tracks every scroll. It tracks the accelerometer. It gathers location telemetry and all kinds of other data from your phone while you're using it. And so Apple decided that its interests weren't coterminal with yours. And the thing that normally stops bad apps from getting into your hands became a way to stop you from having a good app in your hands. And so what you need is some other force, right? And there's two major countervailing forces historically. One is regulation, right? So, so w you can go and have a cup of coffee here and not die of uh, E. coli or listeria the next morning because we've got rules about washing your hands and preparing food. The other half of that rule, though, is competition. Right? People can go in and, and make new products and services, and not new products and services that represent an entire break with the old one. Right? The, the offer we usually make in products is uh, not, if you don't like it, lump it. Right? Like, oh, you've got a BMW, but you don't like the seat covers. Why did you buy a BMW? We say, OK, buy, buy different seat covers for your BMW. Even if BMW has decided to make a premium product out of its seat covers, even if they promised their shareholder that this year they're going to see a 5% increase on gross revenues because of seat covers, it's not your problem. Right? Their shareholders' problems are not your problems. They're not a charity. You don't have any obligation to act in BMW's interest. You can buy anyone's seat covers, but you can't get anyone's apps. You can only get the apps that Apple chooses. So one thing that we could do is withdraw from Apple and other firms protections under laws like the D Digital Money and Copyright Act, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, under contract theories like tortious interference. And we could clear the path for people who want to do adversarial interoperability, who want to make new products that plug into existing ones, new seat covers for your BMW, without permission from the firm. We could withdraw from firms the right to decide who gets to compete with them and how. So okay, can, oh, I ask, can I ask a question about that, though? Sure. And this is like, like raise your hand in the room if you use Apple products. Raise that's, your hand the, in the room if the reason that you use Apple products is because you really like it that no one else can plug something into it. Yeah, but right. most people haven't. They've, they've, this is a revealed preference, like 98% of the room's hands are No, no, up. the revealed preference would be if there was another company that let you plug stuff into Apple devices and none of these people chose it. That would be the revealed preference. This is not a revealed preference in the same way that if you go to a snack bar that only has muffins and you get a muffin, it's not revealing your preference for muffins. Well, except none of these people use Android products. There is, a, there is an Android ecosystem. Well, sorry, all right, a couple of you. All right. You know, if you need any help, let me know. <laughs> uh, no, so, but, but no, by the way, like it, it's this is like a little bit of a it, we're not we're not up here to debate. Also, I'm an admirer of Corey, and one of the things that's, that's great about Corey is thankful. Corey lives his values. Like the truth is, like you've been in the trenches on this, and you really do live your values. So you don't just you don't just talk about these things. You really are actually like you live them, and I admire that. That's kind of the the, the the and which is why it's also like it's like boxing with Muhammad Ali. I mean, you've been in the, <laughs> you've been in this since like the early days. You are an, you're an OG in this, right? And so what I'm, what I'm posing though is the question of, you know, I have friends who have left Apple products for precisely this reason and gone over to the Android ecosystem. Does that not satisfy the conditions that you're talking about? I, I, no, because people own their iPhones, right? If my, my iPhone is mine, then I have sole and despotic dominion of it over it to the exclusion of all other people in the universe. Blackwell on property tells us, right? That's what private property is. It's yours, right? And so just if you believe that property rights produce market uh, forces that produce optimal outcomes, then we should have property rights in the things that we own. We should be able to choose who fixes our car. We should be able to choose what apps we put on our phone. If the firm adds a shrink wrap license to your shoes that says you can only use our socks, 
that shrink wrap license should not have the power of the state behind it. It should represent a preference on the part of the manufacturer that you are under no obligation to follow. If they want you to buy their socks with their shoes, they should make the best goddamn socks there are. And if you don't agree, it should be your right to choose someone else's because they're your shoes. So uh, there, there, is, there is a technology that promotes property rights, radical interoperability, and it's certainly digital, digitally utopian, which is, of course, Web3, right, and the whole Web3 web tech. Now, so it's, you know, um, Joseph Schumpeter in uh, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy introduces con concept of creative destruction, which is massively misunderstood and misapplied. The context in which he lays it out is an explanation for why monopoly profits are not the end of capitalism. Um, it's an, when the explanation is essentially, even if you have these kind of dominant monopolies, they generate profit opportunities outside of those monopolies in new tech, you know, it, even in extreme cases, in new technologies that eventually that kind of the sheer sort of limbic drive to profit will develop to such an extent that it will overcome those incumbents. It doesn't mean, this, you know, I'm pro antitrust. I think almost everyone here is pro more antitrust action in this space. But here, here's what I want to ask. One of the things that threatens this engine of creative destruction, taking the Web3 st the stack and eroding and eventually destroying the monopoly of the Web2 stack is greater regulation over particular outcomes that we think are good. Like there's a reason why that Euro Europe's, uh, you know, with GDPR, the European like internet economy is, is stagnating, right? To the extent that we, we enshrine particular end states about privacy, misinformation, disinformation, et cetera, even like anti-money laundering, even things that we think are good, it does, that's one of the only things that can create the level of barrier that actually does prevent this process from occurring. So how do we balance between wanting more privacy, wanting a better information space, et cetera, and actually destroying the engine that could overcome some of these monopoly problems? So I guess um, uh, the question is, it, just because there are bad regulations, should we give up on regulation for me? And, and I think that uh, I don't want to militate for nihilism here, right? <laughs> I, I, I don't, I, I, you know, I've been in places where there aren't building codes and buildings fall down. So I, I would like there to be uh, a, a sort of evidence-based regulation. I'd like it to be produced in a transparent way. I'd like there to be a way to revisit the, the kind of conclusions of the truth-seeking exercise that is a regulatory forum. Uh, in light of new evidence and so on, I don't no, want that's to, utopianism. I think, <laughs> well, I mean, it's 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 a very practical utopianism in that um, you know I, I get on an airplane and notwithstanding if it's a 737 Max, I'm not worried about it falling out of the sky, uh, and it's it's a very practical one in that I think the reinforced steel joists in the ceiling are probably adequate to the job of holding it up, and so I I, I think that we can uh, aspire to producing evidence-based policy that that the the truth, if not knowable, is approachable, and and uh, that we can we can do more than just cross our fingers and hope that the person who designs the building or makes the software or whatever has our best interests at heart. Um, you know, uh, not least because there is no way for us all to do the research on our own. Even if you were expert enough to decide whether or not the cryptographic standards in your software were adequate, you wouldn't be expert enough necessarily to determine whether or not the software that implemented it was adequate to the job. And even if you were good enough at that, you wouldn't know whether the HR policies at the firm were adequate enough to the job to prevent an insider threat. Um, all of those things are, are transcendentally hard. It's, we're talking about getting 15 doctorates, and that's before you figure out whether or not the reinforced steel joists in the ceiling are gonna bring the ceiling down, whether or not your anti-lock brake system is up to the task, and so on. These are, these are things that you have to delegate out to third parties, and firms on their own are not reliable as, as the sole arbiter of these things. They uh, have uh, conflicted um, uh, incentives. Um, I, I think that GDPR is not what's holding back Web3, uh, I, and I think that conflating GDPR and disinformation is kind of incoherent. I think disinformation rules seek to uh, uh, establish a kind of ground truth, which is hard to do. I think the GDPR, notwithstanding the right to be forgotten stuff, which is very bad, and notwithstanding the fact that it hasn't been well administered, the GDPR actually has some pretty crisp standards, right? If you're gonna use my information, you have to tell me how you're gonna use it, and you have to get my consent, and you can't coerce that consent. Uh, and if you wanna use it for something else, you have to ask me again. Uh, and uh, if you're not gonna get my consent, it has to be for an essential purpose, and that essential purpose can't be, I think you'd say no, so I don't wanna ask you. 
I mean, just to clarify my comment, I wasn't conflating. I was giving privacy and disinformation as examples of two different value sets that can drive, that can drive and are driving regulation. Um, I'm not sure it's, co you know, from a kind of public choice standpoint, I'm not sure it's coherent to, di to distinguish between um, a kind of hypothetical good regulation and the kind of regulatory process that could actually generate and administer that regulation. But uh, Jimmy, do you have any thoughts on this? I, you know, it, it's a little hard. We're, we're talking about sort of 14 different subjects on which there have been like multiple PhD theses published in the last two minutes, right? So uh, let's like, like have, we should have some humility about trying to get to an answer on stage. I will offer a couple of just responses or sort of thoughts that came to mind. You know, I think people think policy making looks like the West Wing. It's much more like South Park. Like for people who have actually worked <laughs> in government, Veep. it's a freaking mess. And like, let's not act like regulators are enlightened. And I would say they're so much less enlightened than your sort of tech company overlords. Like, like give me the dictatorship of tech over the dictatorship of Mitch McConnell any day of the week. I'm sorry. Like, it, it is simply because, like, I have, having worked in government, I've seen what a mess it is and how screwed up and perverse the intensives are. In some cases, I'm sure, Corey, you would agree with that critique. In some, maybe you wouldn't. But I would argue that, like, let's not act like there's some, you know, congressional hearing where they're gonna sort this all out. If anything, it's gonna gum up the works and make it so, so much worse. Uh, and I, so I do, I worry about the dangers of that. I think the dangers of that can often outweigh some of the other dangers we're talking about. But the second thing I would say, and this is one of the things I took from the PayPal story, and it like kind of informs my thinking about a lot of these issues, and it does actually track with something you said, Corey, which is I think consumers are phenomenally lazy, and I am sort of exhibit A, right? I could, if I wanted, not click continue with Google or continue with Facebook when I want to log onto a website. I could create an account for each website and protect myself. But it, and it's like four fields they're asking for, and I still press continue with Facebook or continue with Google. Why? Because I'm lazy. And it turns out that when PayPal was being designed, one of the things that the designers and early employees and originators were thinking about was how how do you not swim against the tide? Consumers don't want to do what's right, they want to do what's convenient. And so what they're going to do is try to fill out as few fields as possible. And the goal for a product designer at PayPal in that era was to, to reduce the friction to get someone to create an account so they could use the product or service. Like, we could argue about the good and bad of that, but I think it's worth recognizing that many people in this room are pressing continue with Google, even if you, you know, in an abstract sense, like you might care about your privacy rights, but really you just want to log into the things you can pay with whatever you want to pay with. I think consumer laziness can't be underestimated, and it's why like these discussions, like uh, it's, it's why sometimes like some of the rhetoric just does not match up with how consumers actually behave in the world. Uh, you know, I, I think in some cases, like it, it does argue for tech companies being more thoughtful about what they're doing, but I think in many cases, they are actually just responding to the fact that consumers want what they want, they want it yesterday, and you know, in 10 days, we're gonna want it faster than we do today. Um, so I just wanna make the, those two points. Regulation is like a disastrous process. Like we're, we're not talking about something that is actually rational or thoughtful. Like most policymaking is an utter nightmare. And it would scare you, a, a congressional meeting that's happening behind closed doors would scare you more than a board meeting at Google. The, um, so shifting from pessimism to optimism a little bit, you know, I think almost everyone in the other, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you like to play? Yeah. <laughs> um, most of us, I think, are, are certainly at least sympathetic to the idea that uh, there's too much incumbency, too much lazy monopoly in our economy that it could be that, as happened with Microsoft and IBM and Bell Labs and Standard Oil, that, you know, a, a new antitrust movement could lead to a lot of innovation. And there really aren't a lot of good arguments on the other side. One of the arguments that is put out there is that in a world of geopolitical competition with communist China, that uh, Facebook and Google and Apple are sort of are national champions. They can fund massive levels of AI investment. They have the data to compete with the Chinese. They protect our interests. What do you say with this argument? Yeah, I, I mean, I, it's not a new one, right? Uh, so AT&T, we like to think of AT&T as having been broken up at the end of a seven-year process. But if you start the clock ticking, from when AT&T was first uh, in the crosshairs of uh, breakup action, it was 69 years uh, from the first action to the very last. Uh, the, one of the reasons that historically uh, the, the goal of anti-monopoly law was to prevent monopoly formation, not respond 
to monopoly formations is monopolies find it very easy to defend themselves. They have a lot of dry powder, right? And then they have a lot of important uh, firms uh, or a lot of important stakeholders uh, in the government and, and other firms. So they become too big to fail and too big to jail. And AT&T was no exception. In the mid-50s, they had a near-death experience. The Pentagon stepped in and said, you know, America's going to lose the Korean War if you break up AT&T. You know, wah, wah. Uh, but uh, by 1980, when it was time to break them up, there was another national champion story about AT&T. The story was that if you break up AT&T, this rapacious, authoritarian, Asian country across the Pacific, which steals American copyrights and IP, was going to destroy the American tech industry. It wasn't China, then it was Japan. It's the same kind of xenophobic story every time. It turned out that AT&T's major project at the time was like stamping on the American tech industry and keeping modems out of the public's hands. It turned out that getting rid of AT&T created a, a, a 40 year reign of American soft power abroad by freeing up the telecoms industry to become part of a networked data industry. Uh, and I think that's true today. Certainly Xi Jinping does not act like he thinks that Chinese tech giants are his national champions abroad. If he did, he wouldn't be rounding up their leaders and sticking them in gulags. It's not a thing I advocate, but I think it's at least an extremely important signal of how the Chinese Communist Party views tech giants in China. Um, they're, they're not acting as China's agents, they're acting as their shareholders' agents. Uh, round up tech oligarchs and put them in gulags. You heard it here first, folks. That's right. Uh, I, will, I so won't take the contrarian position on that one. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm anti rounding up and putting into gulags. Yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> well, can I can I just make one point though? Show and, of hands. Who's in right? Who's pro gulag? Pro -gulag? Um, you know, I, I, I'm broadly supportive. It, it, just it, it, it needs to be said. You know. We have to be very careful that like the antitrust regulatory process in the United States is political by definition. The FTC, I think, has is is largely unaccountable. They're unelected. So so let's not act like you're not substituting one devil for the other, right? Meaning I am worried about many of the things that the FTC has done. And I worry that because of the way that system and process is structured, that it is all happening behind closed doors. These are not actually public trials, right, in many cases. So let's, uh, there's just like a little bit of a, you, you may worry about monopoly power, but one should also be worried that the government's solution to monopoly power creates a monopoly of a different kind. Well, I, I, think, uh, I think you need to take the anti-antitrust position here, or the, I don't know if it's, I think it's three antis, which is, it's not like, opposing antitrust power isn't also political, right? So in this country, the, the right of center coalition for its own basically ideological commitments has been opposed to strong antitrust enforcement. So what did the big tech incumbents do? They funded and participated and messaged all kinds of left-wing causes to basically like, you know, it, like murder like left-wing antitrust enthusiasm in the crib. They've completely co-opted the Democratic Party in this regard, and it isn't until now, almost now that we're seeing what is basically almost a bipartisan movement towards antitrust. It took Google literally blocking Republican campaign emails and sending them straight to spam filters to even get the GOP to like wake up about this problem. So, you know, I, I, I don't I take think your it was point. uniquely um, Republican emails, though. It, w it was actually. I mean, the, e the email thing in particular. I'll send. I can send you the. Okay. The, there are other problems, and and you know, I, I, we'll take a we, we can talk about whether uh, GOP email consultants are of the same caliber as G DNC email I, consultants. All, all of my, I'll say my Android phone sends every Democratic fundraising SMS to junk mail. Can, can we can we all agree though that almost all those emails are terribly written and yes. really unpleasant no, no, no. to see? They are, they are spam. And then like That's I don't fair. I really hate they them. Are like like I'd rather get an email from a fake Nigerian prince than another one from either one of the political parties. Honest to God. No, let me make fair. one. That's a let fair me make point. one point about this. <laughs> like I really I like as somebody there should, like the best candidate for me would be somebody who's like I'm never going to send you a fundraising email. Like they'd get my vote. Um, one point when on they this, get their money, yeah. get their money. <laughs> well, a point a point on this that, that operates I think at the characterological level and not at the legal level, which is in the it's one of the more interesting moments of the PayPal story, which is people ask like where did the the why did this group give rise to a whole handful of other tech companies? You know, Yelp, LinkedIn, SpaceX, YouTube, etc. All the co-founders came from the original PayPal uh, founders and early employees. And one of the reasons that I think pertains to this debate is that there are, at least in my kind of observation, some people who are simply ill-suited 
for a life at, you know, insert big tech company here. At the time, that big tech company that acquired PayPal was eBay. And there were a group of people who helped to create PayPal that it was like graph versus host. It was this strong allergic reaction. They simply were never going to be happy in that kind of culture. And, and I do think that like the one, one thing to remember is, is as, as much of a boogeyman as we may think of big tech, it's also not the place that a great many people within tech want to work, right? Sort of like I've heard somebody say yesterday that, that Google has sort of become like, like sort of like synonymous with McKinsey or Goldman Sachs, right? That like it's actually a place where like you, you sort of, it, it has some credibility, it has some cachet, but you, you are not going to go there to sort of, you know, uproot the world, right? Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't work there. I don't know if that's true or not. I assume some people there actually believe that's what they're doing and, and more power to them. But I did find that in that group of young people who have to create PayPal, once they left, it was, a, it was very hard for them to be at, a, at the company that acquired them. Yeah, so we have time for uh, two questions from the audience. So, all right, yep, in the back. Yep, yep, in the blazer. Hi, uh, Neil Chilson. Uh, I was actually the former chief technologist at the FTC, so I uh, actually second much of what you said about the <laughs> FTC. Um, I, Corey, I, I, you're one of the most frustrating commenters on tech policy for me for this reason, that you identify exactly all the right problems, right? Overpowerful IP, uh, laws that criminalize ad adversarial uh, interoperability, and I would love, I would love to work with you to take those things on. But the story that you're telling about what's causing those problems, I think, is kind of science fiction. Um, the, the antitrust regime that you're talking about uh, was one that was highly politicized. Uh, it, as you point out, AT&T survived it because they are political operators. Um, uh, it was used to crush like the early, um, the, the first uh, you know, grocery chain, uh, national cr grocery chain, because it delivered better food at cheaper prices than your local uh, uh, mom and pop stop, store. Um, it was used by Nixon and uh, Johnson to get favorable media coverage because it was so politicized that they could credibly claim that they would sue broadcasters uh, because there was no standard to which a court would hold uh, the government other than they basically always won. So, uh, so I don't see that as the, the cause. Um, I don't see it as a solution, uh, but I would really love, and here's my question, what, how do we get there? How do we get to uh, reform in the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act uh, to IP reform, um, uh, how do we get to some of these things in a, in a world where the political process and the legislative process is just so messed up? Yeah, I, so I'm, I'm finishing a book right now on this subject. I, I, I we'll leave aside the history of antitrust. We can talk about grocery chains later and whether they had preferential deals with wholesalers that left out smaller competitors and prevented new market entrants and so on. Uh, I'm not going to defend Richard Nixon or LBJ. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, but um, I, 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 I in terms of how we get to uh, an interoperable future, I think the best way to understand an administratable policy for interop is to, on the one hand, have a mandate which is subject to all the capture problems that you can imagine, right? So if you say you must expose an API, maybe that API is bad, right? So maybe the standardization process that produces the API produces something that's not useful. Uh, or maybe the API is inconstant, right? So the firm that's supposed to administer it uh, keeps taking it down on the pretense that they think someone is stealing data, which is something we want them to do if someone's actually stealing data. And, uh, and it's such a fact-intensive question to determine whether it was a pretext or not that it might take us years to unwind it, because like to a first approximation, everyone who can adjudicate claims about Facebook's uh, server infrastructure is a Facebook employee. So it might take you a really long time to figure out whether Facebook was lying. So then you need something else on the other side, which is you need um, uh, the right of interoperators to use uh, reverse engineering, scraping bots, and so on. So there's a couple of ways that we could imagine getting there. One is to use procurement. So Lincoln refused to buy rifles for the, for the Union Army unless they came with interoperable tooling and ammunition for like really good and obvious reasons, right? Like, you, it's, sorry boys, we're not fighting today. The ammo factory decided to take a holiday, right? So uh, we could employ that now at various levels of government and basically the government is such a big customer that it'd be impossible for tools designed for the government not to leak into other domains, right? If, if no local school board bought Google Classroom unless they extracted a promise from Google not to punish interoperators who built interoperable uh, invigilation, evaluation, textbook, and so on tools for Google Classroom for a government customer, 
Google would never be able to stop non-government customers from also availing themselves of those tools. It'd just be too leaky. If every car in every government motor pool uh, was bought on the condition that the manufacturer wouldn't go after third-party parts manufacturers, third-party diagnostic tools, those would leak out too. So then you could just have this, this pool of stuff out there in the world, and it gives firms a kind of new equilibrium, which is that if you cheat on the mandate, either by making the API no good, or by uh, nerfing the API once it's in action, then you end up mired in guerrilla warfare with people who fall back on reverse engineering and, and adversarial interoperability, which produces unquantifiable risks and unquantifiable outcomes that is gonna like, end up with you making bad earnings calls and having giant chunks of your market cap wiped out. And the decision makers who made that call to screw with the API are the ones who suffer the most because they're the ones who've got the most Facebook or Google or whatever in their portfolios because they're stuffed full of ESOP uh, options. So that, that's one way to approach it. Another way is you could wait for them to cheat on the API, right? Which they will eventually, because they're like ideologically incapable of not cheating on the rules that we try to set for them. And when they cheat, because the penalties contemplated under DMA and access are stiff enough, they're eventually gonna cry uncle and offer a settlement. And we could say, okay, the settlement is non-aggression against interoperators or a special master who reviews litigation threats to ensure that they're not a pretext to block interoperability that achieves the same purpose. Um, you know, the, so all of those are, are probably iterative and they, are, uh, they probably are also accumulative. So you get a little bit of adversarial interrupt here, you get a little bit of adversarial interrupt there, uh, some from procurement rules, some from uh, uh, state level rules that uh, say that it's against public policy to, uh, and so certain clauses and contracts are enforceable, so you clear away tortious interference claims, you clear away CFAA claims at the state level by just not making those valid contracts when they're executed in the state. So all of those things add up to a gradual loosening of the space for adversarial interoperability. The more adversarial interoperability you have, the more there's an incentive to just show up and play nice to make a good, reliable, static one. And then, you know, no one ever lost money betting against the hubris of tech executives, so maybe they'll cheat anyways, in which case you've got adversarial interoperability, right? So you've still got a fallback posture. So an example I think of with this is um, the Massachusetts Right to Repair Automotive ballot initiative in 2012, where 80% of the Bay State voted to force automakers to give diagnostic codes to independent garages so they could fix the cars. But the bill was poisoned, or the, the ballot initiative turned into a bill, the bill was poisoned, the bill had a loophole for diagnostic messages on wireless networks, so the big three just retooled and sent all their diagnostics over wireless. Eight years later, they went back to the ballot box in 2020 and they passed another ballot initiative that said like, for avoidance of doubt, wireless too. But in that eight years, you just had a whole ton of like mechanics who exited the trade or went to work for the big automakers, client, you know, customers, drivers who learned that sometimes you go to the independent mechanic and they put it up on the lift and they're like, I can't fix this one. Uh, and then, you know, investors and lenders who just knew, like, don't bet against big car, that was a mistake. And so what if instead, you know, three MIT kids could have designed a, a little dongle that reversed those diagnostic messages and, and unwrapped them and gave them to automotive mechanics because they had the right under the same rule in, in, in Massachusetts, uh, and then they could get a couple container loads made in Guangzhou and, you know, shipped to the Port of Los Angeles, bill of materials, three bucks, retail price, a hundred bucks. The venture capitalists who back them are like, hey, why don't we also start offering warranty services, third party parts, all that high margin stuff that uh, the automakers are really betting on. Well, maybe the, the threat of that would have stayed the automakers' hands, right? Maybe they would have just played nice and let the independent automotive repair sector continue because it's been there for as long as we've had cars. Uh, but if it didn't, then we'd have three rich MIT kids and we'd all be able to still fix our cars. So that's, that's, I think, the way that you establish the equilibrium. You get this sticky, squishy, formless uh, adversarial interoperability. You get this strong, rigid, brittle, mandated interoperability. You put them together like two-part epoxy. So this is a great conversation to continue over lunch. Sure. I appreciate Corey with his focus on, on public right-of-way and build, build your own free internet, uh, concluding with an advertisement for Starlink, which is an excellent product that I recommend to you. Um, you can buy uh, Jimmy's book. The Use Founders. it now before everybody else gets on it and it becomes so slow that it's unusable. Shared spectrum is a bitch. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Jimmy, buy, buy Jimmy's book, The Founders, on Amazon, uh, buy Corey's new book, Choke One Capitalism, anywhere but Amazon, although you can buy it on Amazon. And uh, I hope everyone has enjoyed the panel and uh, enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Thank you, John.